Uh, a uh, person who ran test screenings was not your first love. So tell me before, uh, tell me, when did you know you wanted to be in show business? <laughs> well, coming out of the womb, I think is the answer. <laughs> I did not come from a show business family, although my father kind of aspired to be, he dabbled in being a radio disc jockey when he got out of the Marines. And he also tap danced and took classes with Henry Latang, who I later took with. Um, in New York, uh, who taught, you know, the Heinz brothers. And so uh, it, it's, it was in my blood. I, I don't know how to, else to describe it. In fact, but your, in college, but your parents, your parents took you to some Broadway shows that kind well, of. My, my, my father did. My father uh, worked on Wall Street and he had, you know, we went to Shea Stadium. We practically lived for the Mets and, and he got tickets all the time to Shea Stadium. He also got Broadway show tickets. So the very first show I saw was Pippin in 1975, followed by a chorus line. And a chorus line really changed my life completely. I mean, it was a bittersweet uh, experience, which informed what I knew I had to do with my life, which was perform. And I did as a child and then became a professional into my teens. My mother was not a big fan. She didn't really want me to do it. Uh, she said uh, she wasn't didn't want to sacrifice her career for mine. Um, things like that. And what was uh, her career? What was her career? She, my mother, first of all, had 160 IQ. She was a brilliant woman. She ran an office and uh, she probably could have done anything she wanted. But, you know, and in, in, when she grew up, it, she didn't have those sort of opportunities. But um, when I started working as a professional actor, she uh, came on board as probably my staunchest supporter. But it was not easy. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, it was a lot of begging, a lot of nagging, a lot of running away. And uh, yeah, finally, I understand I, you ran away at 15. Well, you know, I mean, it's more dramatic than it is. I mean, I ran to New York. It's 40 minutes away on the suburban transit bus. But uh, but nonetheless, I did uh, because I, I, I was determined to do it. And I had worked, you know, mowing lawns and babysitting to get enough money to um, to uh, uh, get headshots, uh, you know, pictures and resumes that I needed. Uh, very funny story. The very first one of the first managers I had said, um, uh, you call yourself a singer, dancer, actor, model. And, and then I said, when I was about 14, 15, I went in to see a casting director and my resume said, uh, weight, I don't know what the hell it was then, 125 pounds, whatever, height, five, seven, can appear five, five to five, nine. So I walk in and she says to me, she was like one of these casting directors. She said, show me. I said, excuse me? She says, show me, appear five nine. I said, oh, I gotta go home and get my bar mitzvah shoes, <laughs> which were four inch platforms. You know what I mean? It was just insanity. Well, now, did, were there, are there commercials or anything that we could that oh, you my remember? Lord. Like, Talk, were you in a Wheaties I did a, commercial I did a lot. or something? I did. I did so many things. I was the. I had a pair play contract with Wrangler jeans for three years. I was the toy, Toyota campaign, the Domino's pizza boy, uh, <laughs> uh, McDonald's, George Yoderin. I mean, you name it, I did it. And and I made my living that way. And I'm actually I'm a vested member of SAG uh, as a result of working because you know you had to work at least ten years making a certain amount of money. I'm very proud of that actually. That I still get my my pension statements. Uh, you know, every year. Right. But while you were acting, you needed to make some money and you went to work at a video store. Oh, yeah. And well, I, yeah, I did. I, I worked, uh, I actually worked in two video stores, but the one that you're referring to, I think it was in New York City. I had just graduated uh, one of the best acting conservatories in the country at, at uh, Rutgers, Mason Gross School of the Arts. In fact, I have an interview with them this afternoon. I'm very proud to do that. And, uh, I studied with um, Meisner Technique with uh, Bill Esper, which was the one of the greatest uh, teachers, uh, and Catherine Gately, another great master teacher. And the uh, I left and needed to make money or survive, as we said, uh, be, while residuals were dried up. 
And so I took a job as a weekend manager of a video store on 1st and 77th. The, uh, the only reason I, why that address is relevant is at the end of the story I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, it was called Video Hut. And, uh, and I would shrink wrap the, 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 the VHSs when they were returned so they looked new each and every time. Anyway, I got to know the customers and really understood, you know, the whole the whole uh, business of it all. And that's when I really sort of it really gelled, Hawk, that I had this left and right brain that were um, both very keen to be, you know, uh, encouraged and 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 used. And so when I was 17, I started my first business, an acting and dance studio in East Brunswick, New Jersey, where I grew up. And that was about 100 teachers, I'm sorry, 100 students and four teachers. And um, even my mother worked the front room. And, and you so were like, what, 18, 19? Seven, 17. I was 17. 17. When I, started. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was voted by the an honorary member of the Chamber of Commerce of East Brunswick because they were so proud of this young guy doing. I remember making my first appearance on television as a in, on public access. I remember public access. Of course. And, oh, uh, I made anyway, Waste World. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So now I'm in uh, now I'm in um, uh, I'm in uh, the city working in the store. And it occurred to me that, that the manager was really running it poorly. Um, he was a really nice guy. And so I put a business plan together and I said, you know what? I'm going to buy this store. I'm going to I'm going to make I want to own this. And so I uh, put a business plan together uh, to get some money to uh, pay him off, whatever, to pay it down. And. I presented him the plan and he said to me, you're fired. I said, what? He goes, get your stuff and get out of here. He says, you're trying to steal my business. You're trying. It was the craziest thing. I'd never been fired. I don't know if I've ever been fired since, but uh, it was insane. But, you know, this is a good lesson for people maybe listening who, who get discouraged. And I, when I delivered the commencement speech at Rutgers, Part of what I at Mason Gross School of the Arts, part of what I said is, you know, you can't let other people dictate your talent ever. You have to just go for and I just didn't even look back. I left and I started my next plan. My next plan happened to be working at a furniture store in, in Jennifer Convertibles on Second Avenue. But the, but what I was going to say that the comeuppance, the, the wonderful part of the story that ends this is two years later a little store opened on 79th and first called blockbuster and put that guy out of business. Yeah. yeah. As they did almost all the mom and pop video, video stores. Yeah. yeah. So car karma, you know, took its, took its course and, and I went on to do my next thing. And for you got a, an acting job, I think, out in Northern California. That's right. On the Central Coast. It, California. Was a, it was a theater called the Great American Melodrama. And it was, um, you know, I was an equity player, but it was a non-equity theater. And I um, just wanted a ticket out to California. Took the gig. I was there for four months and uh, really loved the area. Lived with a family who'd never traveled out of a 500 mile radius in their lives and really became part of their family. It was a whole different culture shift. There was this train that would come by uh, during the uh, performances. Ooh. I remember calling, calling my mom, going, "What the hell did I get into? I'm sitting on this porch. Hold on, the train's coming." You know, and uh, and then, um, but it got me there. It got me in California. I remember I was there for four and a half months. My parents lent me about three grand to have a car. I had about three hundred bucks going down to L.A. I didn't have residuals anymore because I hadn't worked in commercials now for for five, six months. And so uh, I had to reinvent myself once again. I remember coming into LA and crying as I'm coming down the 101, not for tears of, of, of sadness, but of sheer excitement as to, and, and, and Cork, you grew up in the town, so I don't know if you know, but I still, to this day, do not take for granted when I pass the Hollywood sign and the gorgeous mountains and the terrain and the homes and the, it's just, we live in the most glorious place. And that was what I was crying about. And I knew that if I, if I just believed in myself, I was going to get to where I needed to go. I didn't know what that looked like. Cause I knew if I needed to work in a McDonald's, I'd be the best 
or the district manager of that thing. You know, I just had that innate feeling like I was going to be successful. And and one of those jobs, because I saw this in the book, was cooking for Michael Milken. Correct. Well, my, <laughs> I love what you latch on to. It's great. Oh, yeah. I was a caterer. Uh, and I, by the way, I ended my catering career similar to Scarlett O'Hara, where I will never touch a plate again. You know, it was that declaration. Uh, so, yeah, what happened was uh, I worked for a company called Parties Plus. Remember, she was a huge. I remember Parties Plus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She 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 was huge. Yeah. The woman that ran, ran that and the husband, I think, yeah. also. But she and uh, they would bring in to Drexel Burnham Lambert. Uh, catering, we'd have to go there really early because the market, of course, opened at what nine nine thirty, and so we had to be set up for six six thirty in the morning. For um, so they ate their lunch around um, seven eight o'clock in the morning because you know what I mean it was just so he ate pritikin. I remember the pritikin diet, and I would have to serve him. I didn't actually cook for him; I would just serve him and prepare it and so forth. But then and all the other brokers around, they lived. They were in this big pit. Uh, and he was right at the center and it was, you know, my God, who knew the junk so were, you, were you Were you checking out what they were buying and selling? No, no, I had no interest. Uh, what I was doing was uh, making friends with the other caterers who were almost all, all actors, writers, right. aspiring directors, and had still a couple of relationships that I keep today from that from that time. All right. So now while you're doing I get all a part time jobs, job. you... I get a part. Yeah. I'm working in an answering service was for the pit, birds, type selling typewriter ribbons for the birds. And oh, a girlfriend wow. of mine, a girlfriend of mine who I grew up with said to me, uh, I'm working at part-time at this company where they, they, there's research screenings. There's uh, these test screenings they do. And they're kind of like, um, you just check people in and it's really a no brainer. You get to see the movie sometimes too. I went, oh, that sounds pretty cool. I went and applied. I got the job. As soon as I got there, they said, can you work tonight? I went to the Bookstar on Ventura Boulevard, which is was a movie theater. It's the the Lorena, yeah. Nya, nya, nya. Yes, 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 yes. I have yes. history, Kevin. Oh yeah. man, I know. Well, that's what I'm saying. So you know, you really had put a different perspective on this. We it was I think the movie was Lost Boys, if I'm not mistaken. If that translates to to the to March or April when we tested it in 1987, which is when I did that first screening. Within like three months, though, the guy that owned it, Joe Farrell and Catherine Pora, his partner, uh, essentially saw how I was relating to the studio folks and 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 said, well, he, he should have him check in the guests. And that's what I started to do. And I made sort of like a really good impression on certain folks and started talking to them. And then Joe would, and Catherine would moderate the focus groups after the screening. So we would do questionnaires after the screening for three or 400 people. And then a focus group would follow. Joe and Catherine usually were the ones that moderated. Well, they were growing so much that they needed other moderators. One was a guy called Andy. And, and then myself, uh, I was brought into the fold to, to begin to moderate. And um, I have to tell you, it was so nerve wracking at first. I had no idea uh, how to do it. So I, I actually used my acting um, uh, technique to play a focus group moderator. And so it wasn't oh, really God. until five, seven years later that I sort of learned the art and science and begin to learn the science and the art behind what it takes to be a, a, a master moderator, because it really is an art form in and of itself. Well, I can tell you that I was probably a movie that I produced was one of your early movies. And I remember the young Kevin doing it and then doing a later movie of yours and watch your growth. But what I know about Kevin is five people don't have the energy that this guy has if you put all their energy together. Thank so you. you've always been nonstop and you have been, you were a terrific moderator. So I'm still, I still, I'm here, I'm here in Denver <laughs> moderating a movie tonight and then tomorrow wow. I go to Sacramento doing another movie tomorrow night. So I am, and this is in the middle of my book tour. And so it is, um, I must say, um, quite, a, quite a whirlwind. What does audienceology mean? Because I liked, of course, it, I didn't win, but I like Don't Shoot the Messenger. So it was don't kill, it was don't kill it was don't kill the don't messenger. kill the man don't kill I the liked man. it too I liked it too I named it I wanted that Simon and Schuster said okay so 
about, I don't know, maybe, I guess around uh, eight years ago, 10 years ago, Patrick Goldstein at the LA Times did the calendar story, the cover story on me, um, which was um, uh, this little known thing called test screenings. Uh, and um, I, I remember Brian Grazer said, you got to talk to Kevin Getz. And he did. And he wrote a beautiful profile. And I was, I'd never had that kind of publicity because Joe Farrell was someone who always shied against the press because we're behind the scenes and, and we are, you know, have to practice great confidentiality and proprietary, uh, and the private, pr proprietary nature of what we do doesn't really lend itself to publicity. But um, I did it and studio heads uh, like Toby Emmerich um, agreed to participate. So it kind of, again, like the book took the onus off of me having to really reveal trade secrets. Right. And so he named me in that article, the doctor of audienceology. He actually also said at the time, Dr. Phil was, he says, he's kind of the Dr. Phil of Hollywood, the doctor of audienceology. And that stuck in my bio. And so when Simon and Schuster read that, they were all around a, a marketing meeting and said, I think we should call this movie audienceology and, 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 and coin a new phrase and who else to own it, but Kevin. And they presented it to me and I, you know, like anything in Hawk, I don't know how many times you've been on a movie where you've lived the movie for 10 years. And then all of a sudden they change the title and you're like devastated. And then you get behind it and you couldn't think it was any other title except that title because it's, we're so close to it. I was like, okay, let me, so what did I do? I was a good, I was a good uh, student of myself. I, I, I tested it. I tested it and That's learned what I was that. I going to ask, did you? Did you I tested did you get it. The yeah, I tested it. I tested it. And you know what I found out is like, Don't Kill the Messenger was really um, much more of an inside baseball kind of title that our industry really liked. But out in the general public, who were going to, most of the book sales were going to come from, weren't as keen on it. They, it was more self serving. I think it was more self aggrandizing. And, and I think the idea of audienceology was to build more of a brand around this. Um, this notion of this term that God. that could be owned by by me and, and and what I do for a living. Let, let, let's go back to before you and before NRG and and Joe and and Catherine. Let's go way back. And because in the book you talk about the history of test screenings. Oh yeah. And I loved some of the some of the stuff. Maybe you can talk a little about about how Chaplin and Keaton and uh, who else? Um, Harold Lloyd. How Harold. they, how yeah. they, how they actually started this whole idea of test screening. Well, anybody who I think has a brain and who works in our our art form knows that you want to satisfy an audience. That's who you're making your 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 art for. That's who you're making your product for. And so early on you know, Chaplin and Keaton and Lloyd would take their comedic sequences, say 20 minutes of a sequence, and they just run up to Hollywood Boulevard and they'd speak to the theater manager and make an arrangement for after the movie, the feature that was being shown, they would say, can you keep the audience in the seats? We want to play them something. They wouldn't say Charlie was in the audience or, or, or Harold or Buster, but they would say, you know, from the studio, we'd like to, and they would then come out and stand in the back and listen, just listen to the reaction. And from that, they were such artists, they were able to create, change, cut, cancel, whatever it was to make the best sequences they possibly could. You know, and Gary from, Marshall, who you probably worked with, because I worked I've done, with Gary. I did, literally did every movie with Gary Marshall. He was one of my- Well, before, before you started, them. I did a movie with him called Nothing in Common. And uh, he would, we would have eight jokes in a I scene. I guess I didn't do every movie with him, sorry. <laughs> we would do eight jokes and in a scene and in the first test screening he would put four of them in then the next day he'd switch and put four others in and then the third day he would put the the four that worked of the first eight and see whether those that, and he did that all we had a million test screenings but he knew what he knew what the audience was going to laugh so, at by the time i'll tell you and, and and cut to uh what 40 years later <laughs> uh, i'll tell you that Judd Apatow and Sasha Baron Cohen and all the great comedy directors today um, do the same thing. Yeah. 
They well, test I, the I have I have one story which I think you'll love. Please, I please. was I was I think ten or eleven years old, and my dad was was testing test screening previewing in Pasadena a movie called Fort Yuma, and I went to the screening, and my dad's partner Aubrey Skank, who was the nephew of Joe Skank, who started MGM, rank was really the head over Louis B. Mayer. Uh, Aubrey Skank's son George. Uh, and I were uh, at the screening and about 30 minutes in the actor who was playing an Indian wasn't an Indian was, <laughs> raises a, raises a rifle and says, I want Fort Yuma. And the two kids, the sons of the producers stood up in the preview and went, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> God. It was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is great, man. So, so <laughs> that I guess is great. That's that great. leads me to the question, which is, yes. uh, tell me the worst, the worst thing that ever happened in a screen, in a focus group. You don't tell me the name of the movie and the best, if you can. Oh, there are so many bad ones. Uh, <laughs> well, well you first of all, good you're, one only, we... <laughs> you're really only as good as the, as the respondent's with whom you're speaking, right? Because, you know, you could get some, uh, you, t there's 20 people that stay behind and participate in a focus group. And as you know, the format of it is almost like a um, talk show. It's almost like it's very chatty and, and, but yet you have to be five steps ahead and you're thinking of your questions and there's no teleprompter, you know? But um, there was one particular, uh, well, there's two that come to mind. One, one, and both of them are in the book, actually. One is, there was a director, a uh, real curmudgeon, uh, and I know this only because when I was a young actor, I was um, and I was cast in a commercial that he directed, and he was horrible on set, screaming, would everyone shut up? I mean, people needed to be quiet, but it was the first AD's job to do it anyway, but he was, I thought, a monster. So I went in very scared of him to begin with. And then I was really, told in no uncertain terms by the production company and the studio that this is the third or fourth time we've done the movie and it was flawed and, and we needed, they needed to really um, uh, uh, do some ma massive changes. And this director was rigid. And I think he might've had final cut, although I'm not sure about that. In those days, a lot, many more people had final cut. So the screen, the focus group uh, starts and I go right into surgically talking about the areas <clears throat> that we already knew from the previous research that were already under um, discussion. And I finished the group and it was very negative and very pointed, but extremely helpful. And you got to hear that too, because it might have not been what he wanted to hear. It might not have been what he might have thought I was leading, which I was to some degree, because I went right in. For, I didn't allow it, the conversation to unfold as I normally would. Uh, and um, he made a, I went up the aisle and he made a beeline across Sherman Oaks GCC, which is, doesn't exist anymore. It's a Gelson's or something. He runs across and he intercepts me and he gets into my face and he says, who the hell, who the F do you think you are? He's this close to me. And I literally went into a Zen state and just let him spew. I could feel the spittle. And I just nodded and I walked up the aisle, my heart's racing. I walk up the aisle to Joe Farrell and I said, he just, you know, drilled me a new, you know what? And, and he said, well, you've got to better go tell the studio. So I did. And they were behind me a hundred percent said, yeah, you know, it was expli expletive, expletive, expletive. And they went outside and had a major fight. And so again, sacrificial lamb, and don't pick on the kid, they called me. Don't pick on the kid. The kid's just doing his job. Look in a mirror. We're, and then the other, yeah, was uh, on a screening in, uh, in, in uh, um, Paramus, New Jersey. And, um, and I was, um, I had to fill a big blockbuster and uh, the star was coming in from, um, from uh, the uh, UK. And the studio was flying in on the private jet from California. I flew in commercially ahead of them. And I get there and there's 40 people in line. And it was an hour before. 
And I'm like, why are there only 40 people? There should be the, the normal rule is for on 400 people, there's usually 100 an hour before. And it didn't change 10 minutes later. I call my office. I'm like, what the hell's going on? One of my employees, because we had such a great turnout, was supposed to cancel um, like a third of the audience. He canceled the entire audience. Oh, God. <laughs> and I had all. And so it was it was one of the mo- I was scrambled to get people. Yeah. We filled that screening with about it was a 400, 380 seat house. I filled it with about 290 seats in 30 minutes with my people. Uh, I said under any, whatever the cost is, whatever, but we did have to reveal the name of the movie. And it turned out they loved it. And I, in the post-mortem afterwards, I have to say they stood by me, every one of them, they just felt bad for me because they knew in how many years I've been doing it at that point, 30 something years that it's never happened. Uh, it's the actor's nightmare. You know, you go on stage, you forget your lines. That's the, that's the frig, that's what the whole thing was. So uh, they, uh, we went to the postmortem. They said, let's do a screening the next day. I'll say, I'll fill it by, and one o'clock, I filled it by one, by two o'clock, they canceled and said, we got our information. We don't need to do it. Wow. So l- let me ask you, I mean, was there ever some guy or, or woman who was in the focus group when they said, now, how many like the movie? And you go, and somebody went, this is the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. What do you I've, think? Um, okay, so one of the things that I think um, has kept me going for as long as I have is I will refuse to let anyone take over a group. Um, and I've dealt with some, I had a guy come in once who said, I left my marijuana in the second row during the focus group. I had someone that defecated in the front row during the group and we had oh, to deal with that. I had the lights completely go out. I've had fire alarms. I've had an earthquake. I've, had, you go. You go. I've had rats come out right in front of me and, and, the, and, the, and the theater. And yet I can handle it all. And be, the reason is, is because I try to get their trust right off the bat and really try to hear them and respect the audience. It's not just some job. I'm really trying to memorize their names. I get their names. And from that, I try to really connect with them. And I have only a half an hour to do it. So it's got to be surgical and fast and, 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 uh, but I've had people, one person said uh, Academy Award winning writer was right behind the group. And, and um, some woman said, well, this seemed like it was written by a 12 year old. Huh. And um, I was pulled off the movie. I actually was pulled off the movie as if I somehow could have orchestrated huh. that comment. Like, right. but, and years later I approached the, the guy and cause I had worked on so many of his movies and I said, I was so hurt that you did. I never did that. And I know he did because yeah. my friend. Well, so let me him. ask you, this is a question that I thought of, but also our good friend, Gary Luke Casey, put, pointed Who? this question to me. Who? <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I bet Gary's watching. So, you know. I know. He said um, he was watching. Hi, Gary. Uh, in a country as divided as we are now. Yeah. And you're going to do, say, an Adam McKay movie or you're gonna do American Sniper, or you're gonna do something that goes on either side of wherever the red states, the bombshell, blue states. Bombshell, bombshell. Yeah, how do you- Bombshell, remember the Fox News? Right, bombshell, right. How do you, do you, in recruiting the audience and especially the focus group, knowing the kind of movie that it is, are you in today's world having to to adjust and really think through so that it's a realistic, you know, you don't want a whole bunch of people who love Trump to, to look at uh, an Adam McKay movie, or you don't want, you know, the opposite. How, of course. How do do well, that? first of all, uh, <clears throat> and without any political, um, uh, my own political uh, agenda, let me just say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm there to be a marketer. So I have got to put that hat on, right? And so there are, there happen to be more democratic and moderate um, moviegoers than there are Republican moviegoers and conservative moviegoers. It's just a fact with m- multiple studies will reveal that. That said, um, if you hit any group with these kind of numbers strongly enough, you could have a really, you know, successful movie. But in the case of like a bombshell, uh, which is about Fox News, uh, the danger is twofold. It's, will this resonate with liberals and moderates? And, or, and will it 
be embraced by conservatives thinking Hollywood's putting their own agenda on it, which they often do think. So it was important for us to go to very red states, super red states, as well as super liberal, and then purple states, which I call purple states, which is right in the middle. And, you know, Arizona is a purple state, for example. And you find pockets of audiences that can give you both. But you need to go to the extremes as well to find out how far the guardrails can actually go. And then uh, cut your movie. You don't want to cut a movie to an audience that's never going to see it. So you know this, Hawk. When I first do a screening and I was instrumental in helping the DGA, as you know, to get the 100 person screening for the director uh, as, a, as, a, as a must. Uh, and I'm proud of that because I am a big, uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of, of the director getting their time with the movie. Uh, and, um, and I do think that um, getting that, getting that um, small audience and having that t- little bit of time should really be with what you think is your target group. Because you're going to make maybe substantive changes. If you're going to make substantive changes, you kind of want to do it to your target group who's going to go and your fence sitters who may go. But you don't want to cut it to people who really are never going to go, right? right. So right. we have ways to determine that with pre-recruiting criteria. They have to have seen movies that are like the movies that they're going to see right. to put them in a headspace. And then afterwards, what their, you know, what their um, ratings are compared to their sort of psychographics, what, they, what their behaviors are like and their attitudes. Right. Well, you which is their to, ideology and their political yeah. affiliation is right. often good part answer. of that. Good answer. So you're you have to be empathetic and smart and looking ahead all the time. And you there's a portion of your book that when I read it, uh, I was like, yeah, that's me. That's what I've done movie after movie. And I thought if you wouldn't mind for those of you who out there who might want to buy the book uh, or read the book, uh, you might want to at least hear this little portion, starting with Mike Tyson. Do you have it oh, there? Uh, I do. I thought if you wouldn't mind reading, it's a short piece. Yeah, I don't mind at all, Hawk. Gives you an idea of what we go through and what you go through. Mike Tyson, the former heavyweight champion of the world, didn't have much respect for opponents who entered the ring with a plan to win. Everybody has a plan, Tyson famously said, until they get punched in the face. In the years since he's put away his gloves, Iron Mike has made a few film cameos, including some memorable appearances in the Hangover movies. But without a doubt, his most important contribution to the film industry is that quote. Nothing so perfectly sums up the experience of a bad screening night when you're a filmmaker. You have a plan, one that you've spent years executing. You've found your story, tweaked your script, convinced investors, scouted locations. You filmed every night until 8 p.m., then gone back to your room to watch dailies, only to be back at it again before sunrise. You've dealt with difficult talent. You've managed actors honing their craft. You've begged the studio for more money, more support, more time. You've scheduled yourself in a, I'm sorry, you've secluded yourself in a dark room for weeks on end to edit. You've lived off cold pizza and lukewarm coffee. And when it's all done and the movie is in the can, you've brought the cut to the screening with hopes that the test audience will rise with the end credits, hailing your masterpiece with your t- and your tireless work. That's the plan, at least. That's the idea. But instead, when the credits roll and audiences give their feedback, the top line results you're handed didn't greet you lightly. The paper weighs less than an ounce, but it hits you like a Tyson right hook. Years of work rejected, a plan failed. How do you respond? It can be a terrible situation, not just for the filmmakers, but for me on occasion. As the bearer of bad news, I've been threatened, cursed, greeted with stone cold silence and in true Hollywood fashion told, we'll never work with you or your company again. There's a reason the saying, don't shoot the messenger is a cliche because Blaming the messenger is often the first thing people do. But after the tantrums end and reality sets in, filmmakers have to dig deep and figure out how to take the numbers and the comments and use them to turn their film 
into one that the audience more widely embraces. Yeah, I think that really sums up what what you do. It's very good, Kevin. So um, now you, you know, having done a lot of these, you seem to know pretty well, you know, once once you've seen the film, oh yeah, I know how the film's gonna do. And I understand you bet one of my old pals, John Goldwyn, uh, you oh. made a wager on something. Can you tell us about that particular uh, yeah, wager? I mean, he came into the screening. It was the first time it was being shown. And he said, oh my God, you're going to love this one. And I said, really? And he said, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so unique, it's so interesting. And I'm like, okay, um, I've heard that about a million times before. Uh, I'm telling you, this movie is going to do 200 million domestically. 300 million worldwide. I'm like, okay, I've heard that one as many times. It stars Tom Hanks, so I thought, well, not, you know. And then he told me the title, Forrest Gump. I went, Forrest what? Forrest Gump. I said, I'll bet you, he says, I'll bet you a dollar. I said, here's the buck. And um, here's the buck, here's the buck. And then uh, we go to do the screening. It was just an experience that was like few that you do experience because the movie was really perfection and and so beautiful and so difficult to market at the same time. Let's not, you know. But you lost a buck, Kevin. Have, re have revisionist history. Oh, I lost a buck. I lost a buck a few times. I mean, I got to say, I have a pretty good track record. I really do. I, I'm pretty, pretty good. But when I lose, I could lose big. I mean, I predicted that um, there was no way that um, Hillary Clinton could not be president. Uh, you know, I mean, I have a polling service. So, but you, you and a lot of pollsters. <laughs> well, I will say this, though. Uh, I was only gauging it on popular vote. And she did, of course, win the popular vote. Again, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm simply saying that nobody knows anything. What, which is what Bill Goldman said. In fact, when I went to visit Bill at his apartment, did, have you been to up at Bill's when he, did he live at the Carlisle, I think, right? Where the, the doors opened up and you went right into his apartment from the- and Marathon it, man, I did with Bill, yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah, uh, uh, by the way, um, uh, I'm very, very close with Michael Childers, um, of course, who was married to your director. Sure. And, um, yeah. and uh, anyway, I, uh, I remember holding his two Oscars, by the way. I think Butch Cassidy in one hand and um, and uh, what was the other one for? Butch Cassidy and... Uh, um, oh, I wanna man. say uh, All the President's Men? All the President's Men in the other. One was a little heavier than the other, I just wanna say. <laughs> one was a little heavier. Anyway, uh, put them down and he said, I am so fascinated. He was doing a book on um, on several directors. He never did the book but he was working on it and he interviewed me for it. And um, he said, what you do fascinates me, just fascinates me. And he said, you know, nobody knows anything, but maybe you know a little bit more because you have data. And that stuck with me. I put it in the book actually. Yeah, data. But he, so was, let's, he, was, a, he was a genius, I think. I don't use talk, that word. Let's talk idea. about some of the ones that I love. I love the story of Moonstruck, which I don't think you, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I but did. I love what what uh, test screenings do to actually change a movie from fair, okay, to amazing. And I, the Moonstruck. Well, I, I, actually, I, I'll tell that. And there's another one I want to remind me, if you will, Hawk, about a little movie that Linda Opes did called Hope Floats. And Forrest Whitaker directed. There's another right. really good yeah. story in that. It's yeah. under the chapter of small things sometimes make huge differences. So Moonstruck was a very good movie. But you know, the first screening, the audiences really didn't embrace it as a comedy right off the bat. They kind of saw it more as a serial drama, uh, or I'm sorry, a serial comedy uh, with these more dramatic elements. And of course, then as it got more into it, it became more romantic and more, but they weren't getting the whimsy of it. And at the post-mortem, there was another screening scheduled for the next night. It was either New York and Paramus or Paramus and then New York. But one of the, you know, I forget the, the order. The editor said, um, you know, we're not giving them permission to laugh. So we need to do something about that. 
And what he did, because in those days they were unmarried prints, you know, there was print, the uh, music was on, and the sorry, the sound, sound was on. Sound on one, one and picture on the other. And picture right. on the other. And how many, we used to have film breaks all the time. I'd have to go down and entertain the audience while they, they spliced it back together. Uh, so th this was a, an, an instance, because it was the very first moment, it was not that difficult to do, to replace the music. The original music was a very intense operatic um, ballad, you know, and then they replaced it with when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a more, you know, and the audience just started laughing right off the bat. It was insane. Um, and they were um, with it from the get go. Scores came up 20 points. Because because it it's it gave the audience permission to laugh and have fun with it. Not only did it give permission for the audience to laugh, because you could say, well, it went up twenty points, but that's fine. But what does that mean? Well, the twenty points correlated into a far more enjoyable and satisfying experience, because what had happened in the first screening is it took so much time to recover, and to catch up. You know, to catch up that they didn't realize the full benefit of the movie. But because they started it so much earlier, they got the full satisfaction and benefit of the movie. The other story I was going to tell really fast Hope was, floats, right. yeah. was Hope Float. So, so in the movie, again, um, one of my um, very dear friends, because um, I did a movie with her, Jenna Rollins, stars as Sandy Bullock's mother in the movie. And in the movie, um, Sandy's character is kind of a, it's kind of a, she's a bit of a selfish girl. She goes, woman, she goes back to her mother's house and, um, and her mom, her mom dies. Uh, in the movie, uh, Jenna's character dies. And at the end of the screening, I remember people were like, um, well, how callous was she? Her mother died and she didn't feel anything. She didn't, she didn't grieve. So Sandy was already on to her next movie by now, but I think it was Forrest or Linda or both of them or myself, Sandy, whatever, we all kind of put our heads together and came up with the idea that she would go, um, they would shoot a scene, teeny snippet of a scene after Jenna's character's death, where she would come, uh, come in with, you know how the women take a shower and they wrap the, the, shamata, the, the, towel, the, shamata, the towel around their heads. And she walked into Jenna's uh, mom's master closet to borrow a piece of clothing. And while she's in there, she's picking something out and she goes, and she smells it. And she, and begins to writhe down the wall of the closet into a ball of tears. Scores went up 25 points. Yeah. And for her, char and for her character. Yeah. And for her character. Likeable, lovable. Yeah. Suddenly she made sense in a way that the audience really appreciated that little change oh by the way they did the towel thing i didn't say because she had changed the color of her hair for the next picture that's the reason they devised it so it's very clever a very clever thing so we did a bunch of movies together but one of them was primal fear do you have anything to talk about with primal fear oh, that's a leading question uh well it to me that was almost revelatory uh I loved that movie. I didn't like it. I loved it. And you know, part of it is, I mean, it, it really is all about Ed's performance, isn't it? I mean, because he's such an innocent in it. Now, I was told two conflicting things. I was told that initially you all wanted Leo DiCaprio. And I thought somebody had told me that Sherry, I believe it was Sherry Lansing, who said, um, don't put a name in this because you're going to tip it no we we actually i offered. know and i was told that didn't happen what happened actually with that well during we kept i guess we gave it to leo he passed we had other people that passed and meanwhile deb aquila head of casting at paramount at the time hi deb if you're listening um i sent it to her so she may be listening but you know she was out looking at 2500 people and she said Hoblet, she, Hoblet met Edward along with some other people and we decided to test these unknowns and they came out to LA and Edward, I, I went into his trailer to meet him 
and he stuttered, you know, and, and sounded like he, he was from Kentucky. And he came in and did the screen test. And as he, as he tells the story, he saw this guy with kind of long hair walking into the stage, wondering who, who was going to do the scene with him. And it was Richard Gere. He had just come back from India or something. And so Edward was even more nervous. But he did the first couple of scenes as, uh, as the very innocent guy. And then there's the scene, we tested the scene where he changes from the sweet Aaron into the killer, Roy, in the middle of the scene. And I remember uh, when, when Greg said cut, Gear turned around to us and looked at us and went, you know, oh, oh my, my God, God. who oh is this God. kid? Oh. <laughs> and we showed it to Sherry. She had some questions and we actually had to do a second test before Sherry finally said yes. But yes, that was Edward's first movie. Well, I have to tell you that uh, what I said, whether it was true or not, um, is actually, I think, a little prophetic, which is if you cast a name in that, it would have put the attention in the wrong place. I think the genius of you guys casting an unknown, it's funny how sometimes movie magic happens not the way you want it to but the way it should and then brilliance happens or some kind of as i said magical moment happens it happens all the time and look at back in gone with the wind i mean you know the casting of vivian lee i mean there's been so much written about it so i won't go into it but the idea of getting that role which was so coveted and so important and just getting the right match you just go you know you just go i mean you look at like an i love lucy and you look at how the mertzes were cast and you say and it reminds me because i'm working on this movie right now with um you know from amazon um being the ricardos um and you know a little late to be working on it buddy it opens uh friday Oh, worked. Sorry, worked. Actually, I personally didn't do it. My company did, but um, I, but I I'm hear kidding, it's just, Kevin. By the way, I hear it's fantastic and got a great review and variety today. And Nicole, I hear, is just spectacular in it, as are the other actors. And Aaron Sorkin again knocks one out of the park. But but what I want to say is, um, imagine anyone else in that, those roles. I mean, yeah. and the fact that Lucille Ball demanded that Desi and and she. Uh, you know, be together uh, or, but for the fact of that, there would be no, I love Lucy. And it's the most iconic series in the history of, of yeah. television. I, I got to meet her in person and oh, she was man. nothing like Lucy. <laughs> well, you probably met her later, right? I mean, yeah, that later. Lot. Yeah. When she was married to Gary Morton. And yeah. She was, she, she was Gary a tough, Morton. she was a tough woman. I'm very, very good friends with, with Carol Cook, who has tells me just the best, best stories who was one of the call out shout out to carol who i love very much and um and uh and i miss we, but she, we only have a few minutes left oh, so i want to i want to go back to, to to we could kibitz for we could kibitz for hours for hours i wanted to, i wanted to go back to the fact that you you became a star at nrg and then you left and went to another company called otx where you Created built a, even, I built a division. I built, a, built division. a division yeah. there. Yeah. But then you went out on your own. Yes. And I want to talk a little bit about your, I'm going back now to the entrepreneur in you and the yeah. businessman. What, what gave you the confidence or did you to, to actually say, you know, I've learned from all these people, I've done everything and now it's going to be mine. You want to know the truthful answer, Hawk? Yeah. You. You and Gary Lucchese and Sherry Lansing and the hundreds of people who stood by me and believed in me, I'm not kidding, mm. who had me, requested me to do their movies. The fact that I was written into contracts that I had to do their movies. The fact that, uh, pe because people know that the process is when their baby is being brought into the world and it could be a make or break moment. They don't want it in the hands of any doctor. They want the doctor who is going to have that 
sensitivity, it's going to have the bedside manner, it's going to have the skill to be able to handle that. Like you mentioned before, like somebody going off in a group, that's not happening under my watch. I would sooner, and I have done this, kick someone out of my focus group and say, would you mind waiting outside? I don't think this is working so well. And I'll stop the room, get them out. I'll pay you a movie ticket or whatever the hell I'm going to give you as an incentive. But I'm going to continue what I'm doing to get the information I need. As Judge Judy says, this is my courtroom. That's not yours. You know what I mean? And they have, I'm mic'd, you're not. And that's the attitude that I take. I am your, I am your conciliary and I'm your advocate. And you guys stood by me and I had enough confidence to know that my company was going to be successful as a result of that. And then I got to be honest, it's the other thing that I did, I think, extremely well is to bring in people better than I was, to bring in more talented people, to bring in people who understood because we're in television and streaming and and uh, in fact, movies are second to our streaming and television business now, uh, which makes all the sense in the world, because as things are changing, you have to evolve with the times. Let me give you a, an example in the COVID times. You, one question that, that people I know have asked me is, how did you stay in business? Because they were still a lot in the can, right? But we couldn't go to theaters. We invented an online screening platform called VirtuWorks. And it allows people, it allows you, Hawk, the filmmaker, to watch people watching your movie. Mm. So you actually get 150 people you can toggle back and forth. It's fascinating. Mm. And, you, and the security is extremely uh, important on it. But what are we doing? We're getting information to help you cut your movie the best way you can. That's, that's all we're doing, right? And we can do that in a way that is um, uh, virtual or in person, but both get you information. And that's what I was determined to do even during this pandemic. So what's next for Kevin? Next is, uh, I'm very excited about the business, the evolution of my business. I just bought another company in the UK called Tapestry. And uh, we, uh, we're expanding. We have uh, 300 employees. Um, we've got offices all over the globe. We do all sorts of testing through Screen Engine ASI, my company. Uh, in uh, all media and entertainment and uh, continuing to grow that business uh, and uh, also uh, doing the things that I love to do. I don't ever feel like I work too hard. You mentioned I operate on a pretty high energy frequency, pretty high level. But truth be told, without my tennis lessons, without my piano lessons, which I take twice a week, both of them, uh, without my working out, without my dinner parties and seeing friends, it, none of it would matter because that's truly what's important. And I, I, I automatically keep that very, very, um, very, very part, much part of my overall, I don't like this word work life balance. I like life balance. So I've got two questions that were sent to me. One was, is there a movie Kevin thinks is absolutely flawless? that I've worked on or that ever, I think, Period. Yeah. well, I think, I actually think the sound of music is uh, cinematic perfection. Um, okay. Because, the second question, oh, are okay. you able to watch movies for pleasure without making mental notes, especially classics? Uh, yes and no. Uh, as you can see the other night, Hawk, you knew I was on stage and I literally said to Ben Mankiewicz, who was hosting, moderating me for that event, I said, Ben, we've got five minutes. I'm sensing the audience is getting a little restless because it's what I do. And I'm in the middle of my own interview, you know? So I always have, I always have yeah. a side eye going on to the audience. Like I'm looking and what's going on with them? How's the temperature? How's the, you know? And with that, I will say, with that, I will say that um, uh, when I do get emotionally brought in, uh, I remember Philadelphia just crushed me. I almost couldn't work. Um, they had to like pick me up off the floor after, you know, it was that kind of thing. That to me is when a movie is perfection, when it, it just touches me in such a deep way, or I laugh uncontrollably, or I'm scared out of my, you know, out of my wits, you know. Kevin, this has been uh, so much fun. The book is called Audienceology. Whoever has a chance, read it. You'll learn a lot. You'll hear a lot more stories. 
And Kevin, thank you. This has just been oh, thanks, Hawk. A, I a so respect you. Time. And and before Jennifer, before you come on, Hawk's book is extraordinary. <laughs> I have read it recently, knowing I was going to do this. I had not read it before, and it is every bit as enjoyable, if not more, than my book. So please pick up his as well. Magic thanks, time. Kevin. Magic time and audienceology. Those are excellent for your holiday shopping. Um, don't go anywhere. We've got Harry's Poetry Hour up next. Freda, tell us. This was an amazing hour. I want part two. Can we do a part two? Anytime. Sure. Sure. Absolutely, because I want part three for me. Kevin, I could listen to you day and night. Thank you so much. Oh, Freda, thank you so much. And thank you for hosting this. And Jennifer, thank you as well. And of course, my dear friend, Kawkach, really talented, talented producer and uh, friend. Thanks, buddy. Have a great Thank day. You. Thanks.